Next up is Dr. Kelly Brunell. Well, what a delight to be here, and thanks so much to Matt for organizing this amazing event, and to Ty for working, working on this as well. And um, this is a very meaningful day in my life for a couple of reasons. One is a number of you in the room who have been mentored by Alan Kasdan, and that's been a very powerful experience in your life. And I've had some very powerful experiences with mentors in my own life, and two of them happen to be here. Terry Wilson, my graduate school mentor and advisor, and Dave Barlow, who was the director of the Brown University Internship Program, and I was in the, the very first class there when Dave put that together. And it was an, an amazing group of interns, Peter Monte and Steve Hayes, Carol Heckerman, Toy Caldwell, uh, and me. And because I was the first in the list alphabetically, I consider myself the very first Brown intern. So I'm delighted to do that. Uh, but it's also meaningful to celebrate this day for Alan. Alan and I were colleagues in this department. In fact, we're right next to each other in our offices for 23 years. And it was, it was a mar remarkable time, and I benefited in enormous ways from interacting with Alan and, of course, being around the fantastic graduate students we had who were so well trained by Alan in research methods and other things was a real pleasure for me. So as I was thinking about this talk and, and wondering what sort of intellectual things Alan and I shared, it really comes down to an interest and impact. Alan and I, of course, do work in much different areas. You all know what Alan does. I work in the area of public health and public policy. But one thing that, that unites us was this interest in having impact and making a difference with the world of scholarship that we were engaged with. Um, and we had very interesting talks about impact and how to create it. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my take on this and how we do this in our own work. Um, and it begins with this question is how good are we really at creating change? You know, all of us are in this helping profession. We want to make a difference out there in the world and in people's lives. But we can really ask how much difference does, does the work that we do really matter? And at the end of the day, is it creating impact? And that leads us to the question of what constitutes impact. And at the end of the day, are we producing knowledge that serves society? And does society actually get served? by the work that we're doing. So these are some of the fundamental questions that, that I've been asking for a number of years. And um, it's interesting when you think about the concept of impact. Now, our field and other fields of science have created our own indices of impact. So you could see here an example of this from Google Scholar, where we have citations and H index and I10 index and the like. Now, the outside world would probably look on this in a, in a pretty strange way, saying, well, you're talking about making an impact on the world and the way you're measuring is how much you cite each other? I mean, how, how, much, how much difference does this make? And so is there a world of impact that goes beyond this? Now, this particular thing from Google Scholar, I just picked an individual at random here to, to look at citations. Uh, but you see I have the numbers blocked out on the bottom right here, the actual citations, H index, and the like. Uh, because I don't want us all to feel depressed by looking at Alan's numbers. That's right, the numbers are too big. <clears throat> so the frustration that I, I was facing in my own work um, was that research tends to reach pretty small audiences. At the end of the day, what happens in most academic spheres is that there's a very small group of people who cite each other's work, invite each other to meetings, uh, get involved with each other professionally, and you feel like a big shot within that world, but does it really matter when you get out there into the bigger world? Their research very often misses key audiences. Those audiences would be people in the position to do something about the problem we care about, and that leads to poor links between scholarship and public policy. So in the area that I was working, which began with eating disorders and obesity and then went through broader set of food policy issues, this was clearly the case. And the, the metaphor that we use to describe this is, is a relay race. So in a, in a relay race, successful completion of the race and your opportunity to win the race depends on successfully passing the baton from one person to another. And I think in, in many ways uh, the world of science has created this illusion that we do our work and somehow a baton gets, the baton gets passed 
to somebody who will do something with the work that we produce and create social impact from it. But of course, we don't know who the people are necessarily that might accept the baton. We're not trained to interact with them. There's no systematic way for us to talk to them, and we're not reinforced in our academic careers for doing so. So the baton very often gets dropped. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about what might be done to correct this problem. And that led us to think about what sort of things does the field do to get in its own way. So let's just say that it were our goal, and this is still the goal, of course, but let's just say our goal were to make science as least relevant to the world as possible. Okay, what would we do? Well, we would make it very slow. It would take a long time to get grant funding to do the work take a long time to get the human subjects permission, a long time to do the work. Uh, it would take a long time for a journal to review an article, even longer for it to get published. And so while the world is moving at warp speed, we're moving at glacial speed. Um, if we would communicate it only with others in our field and not with the outside world. It would be unresponsive to, to important questions in the world because we're only getting the questions we ask from each other. It would be pro programmatic only rather than strategic. I'll come back to that in a minute. There would be conflicts of interest in some cases in the, the food nutrition world where I work. There are plenty of those. And we would create an indecipherable jargon that would make it very hard to communicate with the outside world. Consider the world ideation, for example, when ideas would serve us just fine, symptomatology for symptoms, developmental psychology, psychopathology for kids' problems. I mean, just think about how, how we get in our own way. And of course, we do all these things well. So there are some things that are self-imposed here that we might be able to correct. So we tried to address this fundamental problem by creating a model that we refer to as strategic science. And this lies at the heart of the work that we've done for a number of years. And I'd like to explain what this model means and then an example of how we apply it. So if we want to create social or policy change from the work we do, there's that question about what lies in the middle, what has, what has to take place, how does the baton get passed in order for this to occur? And so what we've begun thinking about are uh, change agents. Who in the world or what organizations or individuals are in a position to do something about the problem that we're working on? And so the problem that we work on um, will have a, its own series of change agents problems you work on and anybody works on will have a different series of change agents. So in our case, we th and we're interested in public policy and food policy. Legislators become obviously important. Uh, the regulatory world of government becomes incredibly important. The FDA, the USDA, the FTC, et cetera, and then the world versions of these and state from local versions as well become very important. And you can just fill in the blanks and they're all fairly intuitive. So depending on the problem that one wants solved, it's possible that lawsuits are the ticket to change. In other cases, it could be a law. In other cases, it's regulatory authority of government. Other cases, the NGOs out there in the world are going to make a difference. But if we can define in advance who are the people or the institutions that can make change on the problem we're working with, we can interact with them. That can inform the research we do in ways that create this positive feedback loop. And so can we create a virtuous cycle of solutions that begins with identifying change agents? Not hoping change agents will pay attention to our research when it's all said and done, but getting them involved early on. That helps us develop strategic questions for research that we might not have thought about otherwise. Then we can do the research, and then what becomes very important is communications back with those change agents, and hopefully you get this virtuous cycle going. Now, um, I, I could give you a number of examples of this, but I'd like to give you one example, and it's the public policy involving taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages. So this is a topic that I've worked on for going on 30 years now. Uh, but there are several things that we did that fit into this strategic science model that we hope will be helpful in creating impact. So sugar-sweetened beverages are bad actors. Uh, we don't need to walk through all the physiology of it, but take my word for it, they're, they're not good. And in terms of public health, they're creating enormous damage, especially to children. Um, so in 2009, um, I wrote a piece with Tom Frieden, who Tom was the, at the time the health commissioner in New York City, then later become the, became the head of the CDC, 
uh, on making a public policy case for putting a tax on sugar beverages. And the concept is fairly intuitive, very much like tobacco taxes, that you take something that people are consuming more than the public health priorities would suggest, you put a tax on it, you raise the price, therefore lower consumption and get public health benefit, and potentially use the revenue to, to meet other public health goals. So we made the public policy case for doing this back in 2009. Now the, the case, we actually made the case going back many more years than that, but it had kind of been dormant, not too many public policy people had paid attention to it. But in 2009, the issue came back up again because the economy w was not doing well and governments were looking for ways to raise revenue. And what better way to raise revenue with something like this that could lower health care costs at the same time? So we resurrected the idea, uh, pushed forward with this particular piece, and then followed with a longer piece in the, the same publication making both a public health and an economic case for taxing sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, as you know, those of you who've had any background in economics will know that economists generally favor not getting involved with um, changes like this unless certain conditions are met. And two of those conditions are information asymmetries and externalities. And we made the economic case that said that we've satisfied both criteria and therefore a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages would be in order. So this provided the conceptual background and a little bit of economic modeling for how it might be helpful to do these taxes. But we thought that some other strategic research would be helpful, and I'd like to share, with, share that with you now. So when I was directing the Rudd Center uh, that was here at Yale, um, we had an economist working with us, Tanya Andreeva. And Tanya was extremely helpful in doing several pieces of research, and this is one of them. This one took um, did, did economic modeling on price elasticity of sugar beverage consumption. So more or less what it did was it said, how much do you have to raise the price to get an appreciable change in consumption? So that provided a blueprint for the public policymakers. So do we raise price by 5%, by 7%, by 10%, by 20 and we, we could figure out by this model what break point you'd get where the price would get high enough to start to have an appreciable impact on consumption. Another interesting consideration is revenue. How much money could be raised if you put such a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages? Well, it turns out to be a lot, and we wanted to figure out how much. So we did uh, some more strategic science. In this case, modeled the amount of revenue that could be raised by different uh, places if they used a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. But instead of just putting that in the literature, uh, which was a, a good start, we created a website that was a revenue calculator for working on sugar beverage taxes. So you could go in, into this calculator, and you still can, and put in any major city or any state in the United States, and now for some places outside the country, and figure out how much revenue would be generated by taxes at certain levels. And so it generates, this is for Pennsylvania where I gave a talk recently, but it generates a chart like this. The bottom line is on the, the number you see on the bottom right. So a tax of one penny per ounce on any beverage with added sugar, which would be about a 15% increase in price, between 10 and 15%, would raise $549 million per year for the state of Pennsylvania. So we've now handed the, the legislators a sense of how much price would have to change in order to get changes in consumption and how much revenue would be raised at the same time. So this becomes a real toolkit. So the, the research literature wasn't telling us that these were important questions to ask, but they came out of discussions with the policymakers and therefore became part of this strategic science model. So now these sugar beverage taxes exist in a number of cities in the United States. Uh, Philadelphia is the largest, but Seattle, San Francisco are also large cities. Chicago Cook County had one, but repealed it recently, and there's hope that they might put it back in. But if you look around the world, there are a lot more places that have these sugar beverage taxes, including some um, major countries like France and uh, Mexico. And now the results uh, have been, uh, are being obtained from the impact of these taxes in various places, and the results are very impressive. Water consumption is going up, sugar beverage consumption is going down, the revenue estimates are pretty much what people expected, and so the fact that these are spreading around the world is really heartening, at least to us. 
So this would be an example of the strategic science model, and to the extent that our work has been uh, part of this process, has been influential in it, we feel that the, the paths that it occurs are through legislators who are actually passing the taxes, through public opinion, because the legislators have to have cover for doing these things, and through the NGO community, which is extremely important in getting these passes taxed in city after city and country after country. So this would be an example of the application of a strategic science model in order to create impact. Now I know this is different than the way Alan is choosing to apply um, his own science to create impact, but it's an issue he cares very deeply about. And it was something where our interactions around these issues were, were, very, were very influential to me, and so I appreciate that, the intellectual time we had together to discuss those things. I'd like to talk a little bit about application of this model and strategic science into what I'm looking at as Alan Kasten's scientific trajectory. Now we all know um, about the fundamental things Alan has done, uh, research design, uh, developmental psychopathology, and the kind of work that he does that's had enormous impact on the field. But some of you may not know that he's, he's, his, he's applied his, his talent into some areas that are pretty surprising. So did you know, for example, that Allen's presidential address for the American Psychological Association was on environment and sustainability issues? Who thought? Who would ever know? Alan Kansett would work on these kind of issues. It's, it's a sign of a nimble mind and a scientist who's interested more than one, just one problem. Uh, he's done a paper on eating disorders. Those of us who worked on eating disorders never would have expected Alan to be involved in that field, but here he came. Um, and then there's some really interesting and provocative work that he's done more recently. So he's done work with pets and how pets can have an impact on people. Very interesting application of his work into an interesting area. And then he's worked with robots, pets and robots, who would have thought? So very interesting things. So the question is, where, where is he, <coughs> where is he going to go next? Okay, he worked with real therapists, you know, and, and uh, delivering treatment. He worked with pets, works with robots. Where is it going to go next? I think there's only one choice, Alan, and you probably haven't divulged this yet, but <coughs> I think it's going to have something to do with aliens, alien-assisted therapy. I think it's a real natural fit for you. Now, not judgmental aliens like this one might happen to be, <coughs> but friendly aliens with brains the size of yours, Alan. Now, there are a lot of advantages to alien-assisted therapy, as one might imagine. So I'm expecting there will be a whole body of research on this. Don't you think it's a natural progression? I think so. But I'd also like to mention just something about Alan's impact on my own career trajectory. And it has a connection to music. So this is Kirtland Hall, where Alan and I had offices next to one another. Um, early on in my, uh, my time at Yale, I worked with my colleague uh, to create a band that we called the Professors of Bluegrass. And the colleague that I did with this, the person second from the left, is Peter Salovey. And you notice him uh, in a, you know, with his mustache and sitting there behind the upright bass. So we played around and really had a lot of fun and had a nice time with our music. So there was a second iteration of that same group that we called the Road Brothers. And this is us performing uh, at a different menu. Uh, the person on the left is my son, Kevin, who played with us. Uh, Greg McCarthy. Greg is here. Can you raise your hand, Greg, so people know who you are? Highly talented musician and a member of the Road Brothers and uh, Brett Logan, a number, another important person in the psychology department at Yale, was our banjo player. So we would practice in our office sometimes during the day, right next to Alan's office. And Alan was very gracious. He would always say how nice our music was and things like that. He was very kind about it. And we had a good time playing, even though we made quite the racket. <laughs> but I found out something later that had an important um, influence on my career trajectory. And that is, I, I started meeting people, record producers and music producers, 
who said they were interested in our music, but I never knew it at the time. So they said, we, we were coming to hear your music, but we never got to see you. And I wondered what in the heck happened and why we weren't able to meet up with these record producers. Well, we've been able to reproduce it. So here's one such record producer. So I asked this record producer, what, how, come you didn't, um, how come we didn't get to see you when you came to the office? And this is what he said. So somebody was systematically interrupting this relationship we might have had with the record producers. Here's another example of some record producers. <laughs> and then the last one might be this. Another important record producer. So we had the opportunity to have an important career in music that got interrupted by Alan intercepting these people coming to the office. So what could have been this, what could have been a career that looked like this, got dashed because of Alan Kazan. So look at all these things we could have had. But unfortunately, the hopes got dashed and instead I'm stuck with a career where I have to worry about things like this. <laughs> So thank you again, Matt, for uh, putting this together. I really appreciate the time. And Alan, thank you for so many years of being an absolutely wonderful colleague. It's uh, very it's years I treasure, and, and the intellectual colleagueship, your humor, and everything else you brought to are wonderful. So thank you.